Um, so welcome everyone um, to the Micronography webinar. Uh, my name is Nick. I am just your, your host today. Um, I am joined um, by my colleagues, um, Amy Chi and Paramal Karcha. And I uh, just want to give you some housekeeping rules. So yes, you can ask questions in the chat or the um, Q&A. And, &A, and um, if it's something trivial, then our team will answer these. Otherwise, please wait to the end and um, I'll just read out the questions and then Paul will be happy to answer. So without further ado, I'd just like to um, uh, introduce our guest speaker here, uh, Professor Vaughan Macefield, uh, who will be uh, starting doing a webinar for us on micronography. So I'll just like to share my screen there. You can take it away. Thanks, Vaughan. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I believe there are some friends of mine around the world listening in, so hi. I'd like to see you in person again very, very soon. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be just giving an overview on micronography, which is a means of recording from peripheral nerves and humans. Uh, just a brief overview. It was uh, developed by Carlo Kagbach and Olga Valdez in Sweden in the 60s. The great pleasure to have worked with both of those and with their students. And I've trained many students myself. But as you can see, it's uh, contributed a lot of information on tactile systems, proprioception, pain, sensory motor control, and control of the sympathetic nervous system. And I'll be touching on quite a few of these today. Um, so tungsten microelectrodes can be inserted into any accessible peripheral nerve, such as the median or ulnar nerve of the wrist, or the upper arm, the perineal or tubular nerves at the knee, or the serial nerve at the ankle. And I'll also be talking about another approach we've developed. They can also be inserted into branches of cranial nerves, such as the inferior alveolar, superorbital branches of the trigeminal nerve. And again, I'll be talking about another approach we've developed for uh, obtaining information from another cranial nerve, the vagus nerve. So I use the uh, NeuroAmp X, the amplifier uh, developed by AD Instruments. Um, this was the, uh, actually, uh, I can say that I was the design consultant for this. Uh, so I provided all the specs and tested all the prototypes and it's a fantastic, dare I say, uh, amplifier. And as you can see from the uh, symbol here, it's safe for human connection. Now, AD Instruments uh, put all, all of their hardware through rigorous testing protocol to obtain this certification and many other uh, producers such as WPI um, do not. Even though their amplifiers are used uh, in human situations, they're not, they always have a warning saying not for human use. This is not the case with the NeuroMX. So it's got a very wide band pass, very high signal to noise ratio. And because we're recording from very small nerve signals, uh, they had to be amplified 20,000 times. Uh, there is this head stage, which is connected to the, to the front end, the NeuroMX. Um, this is made from high grade stainless steel. And because of the, the shape of the, of the amplifier, it is ideal for animal use too, because it can go into a Narashigi micro manipulator. So it can be inserted into the brain of uh, awake animals, for instance. But I'm going to be talking about this use for human studies. So this is what we do. We have, there are three terminals, uh, as you can see here, and we attach a reference electrode, an active electrode, and a ground electrode, which is just a surface electrode attached to the skin. It's a differential amplifier, which means that it's measuring the voltage or the potential difference between the active electrode, which is inserted into the nerve, and the reference electrode was inserted just under the skin. And the, the reference electrode is basically a, a tungsten microelectrode from which uh, a millimeter or two of the insulation has been removed from the tip. The active electrode is a high impedance microelectrode. Um, 
And for single unit recordings, we typically want an impedance above 700 kilohertz. But often we can get very good recordings with lower impedances. So we use uh, electrical stimulation to, to uh, guide the microelectrode through the tip. We give weak pulses of 10 microamps to 1,000 microamps, so 1 milliamp, uh, 200 microseconds in duration. And we use this to guide the microelectrode into a fascicle of the nerve. Now, for instance, the common perineal nerve of the fibular head is composed of distinct fascicles supplying other muscle skin. And we know from experience that once we get a twitch or a radiating paresthesia, pins and needles, in the innovation territory at 20 micrograms, we know we have entered the fascicle. And the advantage of this approach is that you can identify the fascicle based on the responses to intraneural stimulation. So if we're getting dorsiflexion of the ankle, we know that we've got tibialis anterior, we can see the muscle contracting. Uh, if we've got extensor halsus longus, then just the big toe goes up and, and so on and so forth. Now, often as we are uh, recording, as, as soon as we penetrate the fascicle or move from one fascicle to another, we get this characteristic burst of impulses, which we call an insertion discharge. So uh, a very uh, high frequency discharge, and this is simply due to mechanical stimulation of the axons close to the tip of the microelectrode, generating ectopic impulses. And it's always wise to wait for that to settle down because often it reveals that you've impaled a single axon, such as in this case, a muscle spindle afferent. This is recording from a muscle fascicle of the common perineal nerve. Now within the nerve, as I mentioned, it's composed of distinct fascicles supplying either muscle or skin. The only difference there for the common perineal nerve is extensor halus longus, the, the muscle that raises the big toe. There's also a little patch of skin just between the, um, the big toe and the second toe. So it's very important to be aware of that, which uh, is particularly relevant when discussing sympathetic nerve recordings. You need to know that the, the recording is uh, supplying muscle or skin. So here we have a microelectrode that's impaled a myelinated axon uh, recording from a muscle spindle ending. These are often spontaneously active. And down here we have a recording from a single uh, muscle vase constrictor neuron. I'll come back to, to these later. But first I'll talk about the myelinated axons. And as you can see, they have generate positive going spikes, whereas the unmyelinated axons uh, generate negative going spikes. And that's just because unmyelinated axons, C fibers do not have, by definition, the insulating myelin. So the action potential, uh, the ion fluxes are, uh, are occurring across the whole length of the axon rather than just at the nodes of Ranvier in a myelinated axon. So positive going spikes, myelinated axons, negative going spikes, uh, C fibers or unmyelinated axons. So I'll first talk about myelinated sensory axons, afferents. Uh, this is a typical recording from a muscle spindle ending. As I mentioned, they're often spontaneously active at rest. This is in extensor halysis longus, so muscle spindle primary ending. And uh, just applying, a, we've got a force transducer over the big toe, and pushing back down on the big toe, represented by this uh, negative going deflection, which indicates plant deflection, pushing down on the big toe generates an increase in firing rate. And this is of course, rate dependent. So slow push down, causes a slow increase in firing rate. And you can see here different uh, rates and amplitudes of muscle stretch. These are exquisitely sensitive uh, stretch receptors located in muscle and they are essentially our primary proprioceptors that tell our brain where our limbs are in space. Of course, cutaneous afferents 
contribute to that function as well. And I'll come back to that later. They, muscle spindles are also uh, responsive to active contractions, so voluntary contractions of the muscle. And you can see here that typically when we make a weak voluntary contraction, this is now an upgoing contraction. So uh, a voluntary contraction lifting up the big toe Here's the EMG and the, the root mean squared EMG, the smooth profile. The muscle spindle, because it's located in parallel to the muscle fibers, uh, extra fusel muscle fibers, is unloaded uh, during a contraction. But if the contraction is strong enough and you engage gamma motor neurons, the fused motor neurons, then that unloading can be offset and we can maintain this firing of the muscle spindle. So this is an important a uh, feature of muscle spindles. They're the only mechanoreceptors in the somatosensory system that have their own innovation, their own, sorry, motor innovation in the form of gamma motor neurons, which can control the sensitivity of the muscle spindle to stretch. And muscle spindles being uh, very sensitive length detectors. They're particularly sensitive to very small length changes, such as uh, occur during vibration. So if we apply a vibrating stimulus over the muscle belly, this is the same recording of the extensor hallucis longus, uh, we can see that we can get entrainment or partial entrainment of the muscle spindle to the vibratory cycles. And here, even just applying vibration over the toenail, uh, this is very, very remote from the actual receptor, which is located very high up in the shin. Um, exquisitely sensitive. So that mechanical uh, stimulation of the toe, just applying a very small amplitude vibration, is transmitted up through the tendon, the extensor houses along this tendon, up to the receptor location. So it is very, it's very important, and I know many of you are just interested in the, in the sympathetic nervous system, but it is important to know what you are also recording, which can help define whether you're in a muscle fascicle or a cutaneous fascicle. And also there's a wealth of information out there on the somatosensory system, therefore exploring. So half of my work involves the sympathetic nervous system, the other half the somatosensory system. Uh, we recently uh, further characterized the behavior of muscle spindles by using ultrasound to measure the changes in muscle fascicle length. And you can see here, this is the ankle angle. This is a fascicle length, muscle fascicle. So when I say muscle fascicle in this context, it is the fascicle of the muscle itself, not of the, the nerve. So changes in muscle fascicle length and velocity. This is a recording from a muscle spindle ending in tibialis anterior. And we're just applying very, very small amplitude sinusoidal uh, rotations about the ankle. And we can see, as I showed you in the earlier slide, that uh, firing rates are encoding both fascicle length and fascicle velocity. Now, these small angle changes are similar to those experienced during standing. These recordings were obtained uh, in seated participants. We're recording from the common perineal nerve. But we were interested in, in recording from uh, muscle spindles in the foot, the, the tiny muscles in the intrinsic muscles of the foot during free standing, free unsupported standing. Now, this hadn't been done before. Um, so we developed an approach where we inserted a microelectrode into the posterior tibial nerve, which is located behind the medial malleolus of the ankle. So here we have the head stage again, microelectrode inserted uh, parallel to the Achilles tendon and directed towards the uh, posterior tibial nerve. Now this is the nerve, a branch of the serial nerve, which runs down uh, uh, behind the calf muscles and supplies the small muscles of the foot, many, many muscles in the foot, and also the, the skin on the sole of the foot. So we could recall from both muscle spindles and cutaneous afferents in the sole of the foot during freestanding. 
Um, this hadn't been done before. And as I said, we had to develop this approach. The advantage of this approach is that there's very, when you, when you uh, stand up, there are very, very small changes in ankle angle if, 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 if the leg is just supported, uh, you know, seated and, and not uh, resting on anything. But as soon as we stand, now this is the force from the force platform. This is the EMG from tibialis anterior and from the soleus muscles. You can see that a muscle spindle here, I mean, one of the intrinsic muscles of the foot, responds to that uh, force. The whole body weight being applied to the foot. Now, mostly these muscle spindles are silent at rest. Uh, we've characterized their behavior in seated conditions without any load, but importantly during standing. And you can see that this is a, a, a muscle spindle ending in the uh, flexor digitorum brevis, a very small muscle that flexes the toes. And this we've asked the participant to just push down on the, to actively contract the toes, push down on the force plate. And here, the person, the subject is standing. So this is the, the background force. And you can see the force goes down as, as, as pushing uh, occurs. And this is just spontaneous uh, changes in firing of the muscle spindle during postural sway. And we've imposed uh, displacements of the body on this motorized platform so we can characterize how muscle spindles respond during freestanding, which is exciting, we think. Now, cutaneous receptors, uh, a very important uh, class of uh, mechanoreceptors, uh, there are, they come in different flavors, uh, rapidly adapting, slowly adapting, and their, their firing patterns are really determined by the specializations of the, of the mechanoreceptor ending. So they're all myelinated axons, but as you can see here, they have different uh, features, uh, different specializations of the actual sensory ending. And it's those features that determine the firing properties of these endings. If we look at the, at the Pacinian corpuscle, this is the axon, this is the generator region, so this is the uh, part of the axon, the very tip of the axon, which is, has, has no myelin. But you can see that it's surrounded by these lamellae, fluid-filled uh, layers, which essentially act as a high-pass filter. These have exquisite sensitivity to mechanical stimulation. They are the receptors in the skin that have the lowest mechanical thresholds. And because of this high pass filtering feature, they only respond to uh, very brisk mechanical events, such as blowing over the skin. These are the receptors that would respond to an ant crawling over your skin, but they respond to just blowing over the receptive field and even tapping uh, remotely to the uh, to the receptive field. They have very large fields, uh, receptive fields, but as you can see, exquisite mechanical sensitivity. Another class of afferent, uh, slowly adapting type two endings, which have large receptive fields, except there's a, a group that are located in the borders of the nails. Now they, they are slowly adapting, as you can see here, you apply an indentation uh, directly to the receptive field. They have these well-defined hot spots and they can generate high firing rates. Um, but if we apply forces to the finger pad in different directions, you can see that they have a very marked directional sensitivity. They each ending has a preferred direction. Um, which we can see here, different directions being applied and different amplitudes. Uh, so in here, we're applying a force at 10 degrees, the normal, 20 degrees, then 30 degrees over in C. And you can see that um, this ending, and indeed all the endings around the nail beds, have exquisite directional sensitivity. This makes them ideal for encoding contact forces applied to the finger pad. Okay, so now on to recording sympathetic nerve activity. I'll start with uh, muscle sympathetic nerve activity. And uh, 
so oops. So this is a, a recording with a fairly high impedance electro is what we call an oligo unitary recording. Oligo means few. So there are a few units in there. These are the negative going spikes, the action potentials generated from a few axons that are located close to the, the tip of the microelectrode. Now you can see the background noise of this recording is very low. This is of course, recorded using the neuroamp, the background, uh, the root mean square uh, signal, very low below, uh, typically below two microvolts. And this means that we've got a very high signal to noise ratio. Now, that is a good recording, but not all recordings are as good as that. We can have a typical multi-unit recording. This, the, the background noise is, is quite high. There's a, a bit of ongoing afferent activity, but we can clearly identify these negative going spikes, bursts of muscle synthetic nerve activity that are occurring spontaneously and have clear cardiac rhythmicity. This is the root mean square uh, process signal, which is calculated in the lab chart. And this is the integrated nerve. Uh, signal, which most people are used to. I prefer the root mean square because it gives a much smoother profile and it doesn't suffer from the time lag that an integrator introduces. So an integrator will introduce the time constants 100 milliseconds, it will introduce its time lag of 100 milliseconds, which is not of much consequence, but the root mean square being a moving average, there is no time lag. Now, this is a, a typical multi-unit unit recording. On the right is an oligo-unitary recording, so just a few spikes firing. There's also these, these low amplitude spikes in the background. But when you have such a focal recording like this, you don't really see much in either the root mean square signal or the integrated signal. This is important to be aware of this because most people uh, are just interested in this signal. They're not interested in the raw nerve signal in, in terms of they don't analyze it because most people are just interested in counting the number of bursts per minute, number of bursts per 100 heartbeats, measuring the amplitude of the burst, etc. But that is difficult when you have a recording like this. You would look at that, if you're just looking at these top two traces, you say, this is not a very good recording but clearly you can identify synthetic spikes in there and you can analyze that signal. And this is what we, we do. So, um, and it's also important to, to note when artifacts appear. So in this box, I've just uh, highlighted uh, in the RMS process signal. So you, again, this is a, we use a 200 millisecond uh, moving average and you can see that this is straddling this spike, this large uh, electrical artifact and we can clearly see that an artifact is defined as such because of its square shape, this rectangular shape, it doesn't have the smooth profile of a burst of sympathetic activity. So very important to, to be on the lookout for artifacts and to exclude them. Now, of course, most of you who are, well, all of you who are doing these recordings are very, very familiar with this. Um, now, we can use a lab chart, cyclic measurements uh, feature in lab chart to detect bursts of sympathetic nerve activity. So here I've just set up uh, within lab chart, within the cyclic measurements feature uh, to, in another channel, using the, the, the RMS nerve, the RMS process nerve signal as the input or the source channel. And we set it up so it detects a burst every time a certain uh, threshold is reached. Actually, we use the, uh, you know, there are various presets. So if you're wanting to detect uh, R waves, you can use the ECG preset. Uh, if you want to detect skin blood flow from the uh, pulse plethysmograph. You can use that finger um, cardiovascular pulse uh, preset. 
uh, actually, if you use the respiratory airflow preset, that works really, really well for detecting bursts of muscle sympathetic nerve activity. Why? Because like airflow, these are slow events, relatively slow events, not like the R wave of an ECG. RMS uh, processed nerve signals, bursts of sympathetic activity are slow. So give, give it a go. It, it works out, works, works very well for detecting bursts of muscle sympathetic nerve activity, which you can see here is done a pretty damn fine job of detecting these bursts. Uh, peak parameters is a great feature once you've got it. So you can either detect bursts with cyclic measurements, as I've said, and just count the number of bursts uh, in 100 heartbeats. You can count the number of heartbeats, of course. Or we, we would mostly use peak parameters to go through the file, uh, jumping from R wave to R wave. And we use the time, the time shift feature in LabChart to move the bursts back in time so that they straddle the relevant R wave. So we, in this case, we'd move it back, you know, minus 1.25 milliseconds, depending on, on the size of the participant, uh, just so that we can bring the burst of activity close to the relevant R wave. And then using, uh, we can write a macro to jump from R wave to R wave and use uh, peak parameters just to measure uh, bursts. So here there's no burst, so you get very small amplitude signals, but here we've got a well-defined burst and we can measure the amplitude, the area, the, the width, rise time, fall time, anything that we like. And we can add that to the data pad. We can set that up to just automatically add to the data pad. We can use the spike histogram feature, which is very, very nice to detect uh, negative going spikes of muscle sympathetic nerve activity. So, here we've got the uh, spikes, the sympathetic spikes. Down below, we're using the same program to detect the ECG events, and the same program to detect the peaks of respiration down here. And then we can, we can generate cross-correlation and autocorrelation histograms. So here we have the autocorrelation histogram of the ECG. So time zero is the first R wave. Here's the times of occurrence of the subsequent R waves uh, and the R waves preceding. So this is analyzing the whole file. We've got like 14,000, 15,000 uh, events here. And you can clearly see in the cross correlation histogram above that we've got marked cardiac modulation. We can, get, we can quantify this. We can also uh, do this with respect to respiration. And uh, using this approach, we've shown that although skin sympathetic nerve activity is typically considered not to have cardiac modulation, if you use this approach, you can actually identify cardiac modulation. Importantly though, extracting the negative going sympathetic spikes, which are very, very narrow, uh, can be used to um, get a clean recording from a noisy recording. So here at the subject tensed up, so we've got some EMG. Now, if we look at the spike histogram profile, this is the cluster of sympathetic spikes. It's not a single unit recording, of course, so we've got a, quite a cluster, but the wider EMG spikes, this is time along here, are shown in this cluster. So using spike histogram, we can just extract the negative going spikes from the EM, EMG shown here, so the sympathetic spikes, and we can reconstruct the RMS process, process signal just from these extracted sympathetic spikes. This is the root mean squared process of the whole nerve signal. And you can clearly see that before the EMG kicks in, we can identify clear burst, but when the EMG kicks in, there's a baseline shift and a lot of these bursts are hidden. Now, this is a very weak contraction that the subject just happened to be making. There's just one big motor unit there, but often, of course, there's a lot of EMG and the signal is right royally swamped 
So you can use this approach to extract the sympathetic spikes. We have used this successfully to record from sympathetic nerve activity to contracting muscles and shown that as contraction intensity of the muscle uh, from which we're recording sympathetic nerve activity increases, we can see a linear increase in muscle sympathetic nerve activity represented as spikes per minute. So again, these are the extracted sympathetic spikes. And we can see that up to, we've, used, we've performed contraction intensities of 50% uh, maximal. So very, very strong contractions. If you looked at the raw nerve signal, uh, it's totally swamped by EMG. However, you can go in there into the raw nerve signal and using spike histogram, you can extract the negative going sympathetic spikes from the positive going muscle spindle afferents, Golgi tendon organ afferents, and the broader uh, spikes of EMG of the motor units. So a very powerful analytical tool. Uh, a lot of this is discussed in this recent review I wrote for clinical autonomic research, which is freely available. Now I'll just talk about recording from single uh, sympathetic uh, axons. We use the same approach, but here we use a high impedance microelectrode. So we guide it, guide it into the muscle fascicle or a cutaneous fascicle. And we're just trying to find uh, sites within the fascicle in which we can see a spike that stands out from the noise, uh, clearly from the noise. Uh, and when we superimpose all these spikes, we can clearly see that the spike morphology is uniform. So here is a muscle uh, base constricting neuron, a single sympathetic axon supplying blood vessels and muscle at rest during a maneuver, a maximum inspiratory effort, this is another recording, um, where uh, we're getting a maintained uh, augmented outflow. So we get burst pretty much with every, every heartbeat, but clearly this individual neuron is just firing away and we can see superimposed spikes and the superimposed spikes that we are recording from one and only one axon. The caveat there is with any single unit recordings, uh, there could be two axons of identical uh, spike amplitude and, and width, but the chances of that are very, very low and the, the firing rates that we find do not support that interpretation. So when we, when we count the number of spikes, sorry, if we count the number of spikes per burst, you can see that they're mostly firing only once. Here it's firing three times, three times here, but mostly once. Here's an artifact, which we ignored, thank goodness. Here during this augmented outflow, the, the, spike, the neuron is firing once per burst, despite these very, very large bursts. And we can characterize the firing uh, patterns. Here, uh, we're just showing in all the cardiac intervals, how, how often a given unit uh, discharges. Mostly, as shown by the white bars, they are silent. So mostly zero spikes per, per cardiac interval. And that is true for muscle vase constricted neurons, cutaneous vase constricted neurons, and, and pseudomotor neurons supplying sweat glands. Firing probabilities are similar around 30, 35%. And if we just in, in, look at those cardiac intervals in which a neuron is firing one or more spikes, you can see that the firing patterns are remarkably similar. And I've done modeling to show that this firing pattern uh, can largely be ex explained by these postganglionic sympathetic neurons. These are what we're recording, postganglionic uh, neurons. Uh, their firing properties can be explained by them being driven by, on average, uh, one to two preganglionic neurons. And these same patterns, you know, mostly firing once per burst, can be seen in different uh, pathophysiological states. Heart failure, bronchiectasis, sleep apnea, 
chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the mostly firing ones. But you can see here that in, in these three conditions, unlike heart failure, there is a, a shift towards multiple firing. So there are fewer solitary spikes and more uh, double and triple uh, spike events. But on the whole, individual neurons primarily fire once per burst. So it would appear that rate coding is not an important uh, facet by which sympathetic outflow is, is graded. Uh, Kevin Shoemaker and his team have, have uh, used other approaches to demonstrate uh, that, uh, in fact, recruitment of silent neurons is the primary means by which the sympathetic nervous system uh, grades its output. So I'll talk now briefly about uh, a recent, uh, well, not so recent, 15 years ago, we developed uh, the approach of um, 12 years ago of recording sympathetic nerve activity while scanning the brain. We've been imaging the brain during maneuvers such as, such as a maximum spiritual breath hold, hand grip, post exercise scheme, et cetera, in the scanner, uh, because you know these are standard uh, maneuvers. You know that if you're gonna take a deep breath hold or perform a valve salvo, you're gonna get ongoing bursts of muscle sympathetic nerve activity. Likewise, if you do hand grip and post exercise ischemia, you're gonna get a sustained increase in activity. And we, we, we've been scanning the brain, trying to identify the nuclei within the brainstem and cortical areas in which um, we could, uh, to identify areas in the brain responsible for the generation of these bursts. But we were interested in seeing whether we could do that at the same time as, as uh, recording nerve activity, uh, which hadn't been attempted because we really wanted to see what is responsible for generating spontaneous bursts of, of uh, nerve activity. So, um, yes, so. Now, importantly, because the head stage of the neuroamp is made from high grade stainless steel, is it intrinsically uh, compatible in a magnetic resonance imaging environment? It's high grade, military grade stainless steel, in fact. So although it has iron in it, it can't be magnetized. Now, because the microelectrodes are tungsten and the wires connecting the microelectrode to the head stage are copper, the pins are gold, there is no issue there. And uh, so we managed to record both muscles sympathetic nerve activity and skin sympathetic nerve activity in uh, healthy individuals as, as well as uh, different pathophysiological states such as sleep apnea. We're currently looking at individuals with different forms of hypertension. But MSNA coupled fMRI and SSNA coupled fMRI, which is what we call it, allows us to identify regions in the brain uh, responsible for their generation. Of, of the burr. So here's the approach. This is a 3T scanner. We've got the head stage there. Uh, the amplifier is in the control room. Uh, we're actually also doing this at, at the 7 facility in Melbourne and uh, I developed the, uh, the background for this at the 7 facility in Nottingham. So all the physicists there measure the temperature of the electrodes in the scanner. In, when they were embedded in agar, they were satisfied that there wasn't going to be any heating. And uh, then we made the first recordings at 70 uh, in Nottingham. Uh, but now uh, Tyder Wood, my colleague here at the Baker, and I uh, have been recording muscle sympathetic nerve activity and skin sympathetic nerve activity at 70. Uh, that's ongoing work. But the very first recording we, we made in the 3T scanner, this was the scanner in, in Sydney. Uh, so we've got these scanning artifacts and we can't see anything in the nerve signal during that. And we heard, we, we could hear over the loudspeaker, we heard this whoosh, whoosh, but it was really hard to see. Um, you can sort of make out that there's a burst here. But then we did what good scientists do. We applied a filter, a high pass digital filter. This is off, offline in a lab chart. And we can see the same recording now with a high pass filter, digital filter, 
we can clearly see these bursts. So back to the unfiltered, filtered, gets rid of all this background noise, scanner noise, and we can identify bursts. So, so basically, uh, as soon as we save the recording, this filter kicks in and gets rid of all this background noise. So, despite the high magnetic field, we can record sympathetic nerve activity from the common perineal nerve while scanning the brain. We can measure the amplitudes just using peak parameters, as I spoke about before. And the approach we use is a, a sparse sampling uh, method where for about half an hour, we are scanning uh, four seconds on, four seconds off, four seconds on. So loud scanning artifacts here, do, 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 and then we hear the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And we can, so we can record the burst of activity in the off period. And because of the, the nature of blood oxygen level dependent signal, which is what we're recording in the brain, uh, there's a five second lag from electrical events in the brain and the appearance of the bald signal. So that's a five second delay. There's also a, a conduction delay from the brain of the sympathetic volley that we're recording at the level of the knee it takes about a second to travel down. So five minus one is four seconds. So that's why we use this four seconds on, four seconds off, and we measure every second within this four second off period, uh, the bursts. So here we've got a burst and we're looking ahead in time, four seconds later, see what's happening in the brain. So this burst that was recorded in the periphery, we're looking four seconds ahead and seeing what lights up in the brain. What lights up is rostral ventral lateral medulla, uh, increase in signal intensity, warm colors, decrease cool colors. So decrease in uh, caudal ventral lateral medulla, nucleus sector, Tractus solitarius, we've identified the caudal pressor area. So these are the same areas that we, we know uh, operate in, uh, in animals, experimental animals. All this basic baroreflex circuitry uh, that is identified in the rat and the cat, etc., is present in humans. Bear in mind that the human medulla is basically the size of the tip of my pinky. So we're really pushing the boundaries. Uh, we can also identify areas in the, the cerebellum, ventromedial and dorsomedial hypothalamus, the insula, uh, and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, interestingly. So this is an area that people hadn't really thought contributes to uh, control of blood pressure, but clearly it does. And in fact, we've been, <laughs> we've using this knowledge, uh, Ty and I have been, and, and our students have been uh, running a series of experiments where we're applying weak sinusoidal currents to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and we can see that it causes modulation of synthetic outflow to both muscle and skin, which is unpublished, but also very, very exciting. So we, can, so we can look, having identified all these areas in the brain, we can then go on and look at how they're connected to each other. So we use what's called functional connectivity analysis. So here we're looking at the ventromedial hypothalamus, which is uh, very strongly coupled to the generation of muscle sympathetic nerve activity. We basically put seeds here. So it's basically doing them. Uh, multiple linear regression between this and all these other areas. And we, oh, actually, we just plant the seed there and we can see what is functionally coupled. What is functionally coupled with the ventromedial hypothalamus is, importantly, rostral ventral lateral medulla. You saw that in the brainstem. That is a primary output nucleus of muscle sympathetic nerve activity. And we know that from animal work, but also uh, our own human work. So this is strongly coupled to the hypothalamus, uh, as is the anterior insula, just on the left, curiously, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex on the right, and also curiously, precuneus. And this is one of the most metabolically active areas in the brain. Its activity is high uh, when you're awake, it goes down during sleep. And we also know that muscle sympathetic nerve activity goes down during sleep, deep sleep as does blood pressure. So we're thinking that this 
area here, and perhaps also dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, contribute what, for want of a better term, a wakefulness drive to sympathetic outflow to the muscle vascular bed. When we're awake, our MSNA is higher than when we're asleep. And we think it's because of this higher cortical region. Uh, again, we can, we can look at connectivity by, by looking at the seed, looking at the rostroventral lateral medulla. We can see that if we look at that area, we can see that it is coupled to ventromedial hypothalamus, as we showed before, insular, precunus, and also posterior cingular cortex. And also we can look within the brainstem. So it's also coupled to the dorsolateral pons, the midbrain, periaqueductal gray, ventromedial hypothalamus is here, and dorsomedial hypothalamus. So very, very powerful uh, approaches, analytical approaches, which basically depends on the, the feasibility uh, really depends on using this MR compatible amplifier, the NeuroAmp X. So finally, in the last 10 minutes, I'm just going to be talking about uh, an exciting uh, piece of work we started last year. We managed to get a few recordings before the big lockdown, COVID lockdown that happened in Melbourne and elsewhere. Uh, where we couldn't do any experiments. But again, this was with uh, my colleague, Ty Dawood, and also uh, uh, Leah Wright here at the Bacon Institute, an ultrasonographer, and a delightful colleague, postdoc from uh, Italy, uh, Matteo Ottaviani, um, in which we used ultrasound to uh, record from the uh, vagus nerve. Now a bit of background, we know a lot about how the sympathetic nervous system operates in humans, in, in, in health and various diseases, but we know very little about parasympathetic nervous system. Most of that knowledge is very, very indirect uh, and it's inferred really. Inferences from measurements of heart rate variability, so nothing direct. And even the inferences that people make about the low frequency content of heart rate variability re reflecting sympathetic output of the heart, there is very little, essentially no evidence to support that. Uh, work done by Murray Esler here at the Baker Institute many years ago, in which he measured noradrenaline spillover to the heart and tried to correlate that with low frequency heart rate variability, showed there's no correlation more recent direct recordings of cardiac sympathetic outflow from uh, um, Clive May's group in the, the Flora Institute here in Melbourne, uh, re direct recordings of cardiac sympathetic nerve activity in the sheep. Again, no correlation to low frequency heart rate variability. Most people on the other hand would, would agree that the high frequency component essentially respiratory sinus arrhythmia reflects the cyclic withdrawal of vagal outflow to the heart. So the resting heart rate, as you're all aware, is kept in check by the vagus nerve. The intrinsic cardiac rhythm is much higher than the resting cardiac rhythm. So there's essentially negligible sympathetic output to the heart at rest anyway, and, uh, but there is ongoing vagal outflow, which is responsible for keeping heart rate low. And that cyclical withdrawal is uh, responsible for the respiratory science arrhythmia we see. But until now, no one had recorded uh, from the parasympathetic outflow in humans. So again, just back on the heart rate variability, it's grossly over overinterpreted and is often applied as a general index of parasympathetic tone on the inference that this you know tone means that parasympathetic outflow to the heart is identical to parasympathetic outflow to the bronchi is identical to parasympathetic outflow to the gut which clearly is not the case anyway early this year as i mentioned we conducted our first recordings from the cervical vagus nerve using ultrasound guidance now people hadn't attempted this before because obviously the vagus nerve runs next to the carotid artery and the jugular vein and it's kind of tiger country in there 
Um, so we used ultrasound guidance. So this was a, a, an approach developed by, popularized by Nishi and Shakudian and uh, Tim Curry at the Mayo for going to the common perineal nerve in, in obese people. Uh, and it clearly works here. So this is a, a very handsome head here. And we've got the microelectrode being inserted. Here's the head stage, the amplifier, the active electrode being guided into the uh, cervical vagus nerve. We've got the reference electrode here too. Uh, this is an image showing the ultrasound probe, which you can see here. And basically we can identify the common carotid artery, the internal jugular vein, scalene muscles, sternocleidomastoid muscles, and this baby, the vagus nerve. We can actually identify individual fascicles. We're, we're looking to get a, this is with a standard 12 megahertz ultrasound probe. We're looking to purchase and get funding a more powerful probe that would allow us to identify fascicles with much higher spatial resolution. Here we can see the electrode trajectory. And as we're approaching with live ultrasound imaging, we can see all these tissues being uh, pushed out of the way and we can actually impale the vagus nerve after pushing it a little. A little. So we just have to push through the, the, the nerve sheath. We have managed to record spont whoops, spontaneous activity, uh, which has respiratory uh, related uh, changes. This was uh, showing ongoing modulation was discharged during breathing. We believe it was probably supplying uh, one of the laryngeal adductors. We also, and this I should point out here, we were just holding the microelectrode. So we just got this recording when holding it. So there's some fluctuations in the amplitude. Nevertheless, with spike histogram, we could follow, we could follow the, the spikes and uh, plot the, the firing rate, the instantaneous firing rates. And uh, we can see that the RMS signal increased with these changes in amplitude. But importantly, we can detect little uh, bursts, which had a clear cardiac modulation. Uh, and this is shown here in a multi-unit recording. Uh, so, so we think that this, this recording, because it had this inverse relationship to heart rate and a positive relationship to uh, cardiac interval, RR interval, you can see that the clearly superimposed here, that this was a spontaneously active uh, parasympathetic axon supplying the sinoatrial node. And this multi-unit recording, uh, we believe, various reasons that I won't go into, that it was uh, detecting multi-unit activity arising from the atria. So what are the applications of this? Well, uh, as I've shown, we can record from cardiac preganglionic parasympathetic axons direct to the sinoatrial node and measure their firing rates and discharge variability for the first time in humans. We can compare these to the known firing rates of parasympathetic, of, of sympathetic axons that we've been recording. We know that they mostly fire about up to one hertz. So 0.5 to one hertz, so sympathetic axons Postganglionic sympathetic axons have very, very low firing rates. Parasympathetic preganglionic axons, on the other hand, have higher firing rates and they're myelinated axons. We can examine how these firing properties are affected in, um, in different disease states, uh, different cardiac dysrhythmias. We can ask the question, does the vagus nerve play a role in limiting atrial fibrillation? Um, we can um, we can record from uh, baroreceptors in the aortic arch, see how their firing properties are affected by hypertension or connective dis disease disorders such as uh, connective tissue disorders such as Marfan syndrome, which has an enlarged aorta. And by recording from the low pressure baroreceptors located in the atria, the contiguous veins. 
we can see how changes in posture affect their firing. So we're going to be doing re resuming these experiments this year now that we're back from lockdown. Uh, having participants on the tilt table, get a recording, tilt them up and unload the low pressure baroreceptors. And we can look at how their properties change in POTS, for instance, postural tach tachycardia, tachycardia syndrome. And uh, we can obviously see how the parasympathetic axons going to the heart are affected during changes in, in posture. And uh, again, look at various uh, disorders of postural hypotension. So it does open up an exciting new avenue of research. And um, yeah, we're really quite thrilled that uh, people have shown a lot of interest in this approach. It's very early days yet. And we've just got that first publication in J-Physio, um, but we're, we're obtaining more data now. So watch this space. Uh, so look, thank you for your attention. Um, do feel free to contact me on this email. If you want to look at my papers, there's that ORCID ID if you want to know, but yeah, happy to take any, any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fawn. Um, we do have some questions coming in now. I have one simple one. First from uh, Osterk Khan. I do apologize if I mispronounced that. Uh, how can I generate RMS nerves from the raw MSNA signals? Uh, well, you could, well, with the, uh, see, I use the Macintosh version of lab chart, which in my opinion is superior. Um, it has a feature called RMS. So you uh, find an empty channel, you identify <clears throat> the nerve as the source channel, and you select uh, RMS and you say, you know, moving average and 200 milliseconds. Now in the Windows version, you can also generate an RMS process nerve signal um, just using arithmetic. And if you look on the website uh, and just type in a search for how do I generate the RMS nerve signal on that chart, it can show you uh, just use arithmetic, the arithmetic feature. Great, thank you very much. Just waiting on some more questions now. Pleasure. Okay, we have one from Eric Dubois. Uh, when recording from human vagus, can you definitely identify a delta from C fibers? Also, I guess the system work on afferent nerves, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so we can identify uh, myelinated axons should have positive going spikes, but it's it's also important to note that even when recording from any any uh, peripheral nerves, uh, you occasionally get negative going spikes from myelinated axons if, by chance, the tip of the microelectrode is close to a node of Ranvier. Then you see the the uh, the spike is negative going, and that was one of the examples I showed. So yes, we should be able to identify uh, myelinated, so a delta axons and and C fibers. C fibers will of course be negative going. So um, is there another part of that question? I'm not sure. Uh, I think the last thing um, they say was also. I guess the system would work on afferent nerve fibers? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So, um, yeah, so we believe we were recording um, from uh, atrial receptors. Um, so, yeah, we can record afferent and afferent activity from the, from the vagus nerve. Just a follow up there from Eric. Indeed, I guess it's in vitro, but can you assess, can you assess the CV which allow to discriminate? Sorry, uh, CV coefficient of variation. Uh, let's see if they can expand on that. Because I, I can't see the question. It's just under chat, actually. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yep. That's great. I meant that I can assess the conduction velocity in vitro. Yeah. 
Oh, beg your pardon. Yeah, conduction velocity. Uh, uh, that would be that would be difficult. You'd need it'd be very difficult. You'd need two electrodes in the nerve. Theoretically possible, but wow, it's bad. It's hard enough getting one electrode in, in the nerve. Um, uh, I guess you could use spike triggered averaging if you know the distance to the atrium, say, estimate the distance you, and, and knowing the, the time delay for the front recording, yeah, you should be able to work out the conduction velocity, yeah. Thank you, Vaughan. Good question. Just waiting on some more. Uh, Eric has expanded here. Uh, I agree, very difficult in vivo. John Adduck does it in vivo, but involves surgery to place the electrodes, so only used on animal models. Yeah, and in, in fact, when I did my, my honours year, my first foray into research in the lab, I did uh, direct recordings from the vagus nerve in, in the rabbit, so surgically exposed cut the nerve and splitting individual nerve fibers in the paraffin oil bath and putting them on hook electrodes. So yeah, very, very different approach, uh, animal work versus humans. But of course, uh, we can get very rich information from uh, tungsten microelectrodes in humans. We can record from, as you've seen, single axons, both myelinated and unmyelinated, and uh, get a level of detail that is often typically unseen in experimental animal work. But thank you, thank you for your comments. Any more questions? That's fine if there are no more because uh, we do have a participant about to come into the lab okay. and uh, it never stops here. It's just ongoing research, pushing back the frontiers. Fantastic. Okay, no problems at all. Obviously everyone can contact Vaughan on that email address. Um, if I can just quickly share my screen, that's fine Vaughan. Um, if anyone wants to contact us, I'm more than happy to do that at ADI. Uh, we do have um, a sales team here and, all, and uh, for any of your uh, questions regarding the NeuroWeb EX, but I'm sure Vaughan will have a much better understanding of that than, than we have. Uh, but thank you very much anyway. Uh, all the best Vaughan. So um, we look thank forward you. to seeing everyone to our next webinar. And thank you Paramal for organizing this and uh, Nick for your support and um, Thank you everyone for, for tuning in. And yes, I, I'm, I'm always happy to, to feel any, any questions on uh, the analyses that, that I've spoken about today. Um, but yeah, again, uh, if you look what's coming out, it, it is available online now, freely available online, clinical autonomic research, uh, a review article that I wrote on um, recording and quantifying sympathetic nerve activity. Uh, in humans. So, uh, yeah, thank you for your attention, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, all the best. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. bye.